Good morning, everyone, and welcome. So good to see you and be together with you to worship God in this wonderful place. As Christian people within the United Church of Canada, we acknowledge that the earth belongs to God and everything upon it and within it. As we gather to worship God, we acknowledge that within human history, we meet upon the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee Iroquois, Ojibwe Chippewa, Huron-Wendat, and Anishinaabek peoples. May we continue to live with respect on this land and live in peace and friendship with its peoples. Please be seated. Well, again, a warm welcome, and it is, the temperatures are beginning to drop even more, so it's great to be warm together inside our sanctuary. Sadly, over the past week, uh, two of our uh, Kingsview families have suffered the loss of beloved fathers. Some of you have perhaps seen the email notice about that. Um, this past Monday, Thanksgiving Monday, Sarah Nelson and Wayne Marquis lost Sarah's father, Tim Nelson, who was a very long time and dedicated member of Kingsview United Church. And uh, so our sympathies and thoughts and prayers are very much with Sarah and Wayne and all of their family. The memorial service for Tim Nelson will be here in our church sanctuary next Saturday, October 24th at 1 p.m. Uh, there won't be an official visitation before the service starts. Um, the three daughters, Sarah, Laura, and Beth, and Wayne also will be here at the front. Uh, if you wish to come forward very briefly, physically distanced to express your sympathy, you're warmly welcome to do so and then to take your seat. Um, so we will indeed celebrate and give thanks for the life of Tim Nelson here next th Saturday uh, afternoon. Also on Friday, uh, David Rosamond's father, Peter Rosamond, passed away in hospital in Mississauga area, and uh, our deepest sympathy go out to Kingsview members David, his wife Erin, and their three children, Scott, Lana, and Graham, in their loss of Peter, and arrangements are being made for, um, for the services for, for Mr. Rosamond. So let's keep that Rosamond family in our prayers and thoughts as well. Uh, we do have two happy birthday notifications today on a, on a bright note, and uh, two people are celebrating actually today, and one of them is Lucas Hester, who's nine today, so happy birthday to Lucas. Here he got a brand new skateboard, I know he's been trying it out already, and hope he doesn't skin his knees on that, but have a lot of fun today, Lucas. The other person is Vedette Isa. Vedette, happy birthday to you as well. Yeah, and many happy returns of the day. And although we can't sing the happy birthday song, Doug is going to play it, and we'll sing in our hearts as we hear him play the music. I'll call upon Janice Patterson, the chairperson of our outreach committee, to share our minute for mission. Good morning. Um, I have received uh, a certificate in the mail from head office um, to let us know about our uh, gifts to mission and service last year. Our gifts totaled 38,932. I'll read you the letter I received. Dear friends in Christ, thank you for all you do to live out Jesus' call to love one another through your gifts to mission and service. God's compassionate presence is made real by the beautiful things that are happening because of your generosity. We are grateful to the people of Kingsview Pastoral Charge who have pr provided $38,932 in 2019 to enable life-saving and life-changing work through our shared mission and service. We recognize the United Church Women of Kingsview Pastoral Charge who have generously given $2,500 of this amount. 
Mission and service takes on a new importance as the Church responds to the worldwide COVID-19 crisis. Our ministries in Canada and across the world are acting quickly to help people whose lives have suddenly changed. In-person outreach programs closed by social distancing have been replaced by food distribution and finding safe homes for people who are homeless. Hospital chaplains are caring for COVID-19 victims and their families. People are being helped to adapt to pandemic conditions and taught how to keep the virus from spreading. Virtual camps and education programs are being offered to support families in isol isolation at home. You are truly an example of what it means to love one another. Please continue to be a part of our amazing ministry. And that comes from the Right Reverend Dr. Richard Bott, who is the moderator of the United Church of Canada. God is still listening, and so are we. If you've sent in your mission and service givings for this year, we are grateful. Your support is making a real difference in this time of COVID-19. Thank you, Janice, and congratulations and thank you, Kingsview, for your generous donations to mission and service in 2019. And uh, we had our um, October executive meeting this past Wednesday, and here are, we heard our financial report from Jim, um, as we do each month, and the good news is the givings to Kingsview United Church, or local givings, are higher than they were at this time last year, so congratulate yourselves. Thank you so much for that. Please keep it up. It's wonderful. That's just a, a real great vote of confidence. It's showing you really love and believe in your church in Kingsview, which is tremendous. We are, however, behind uh, in our Givings to Mission and Service Fund at this point compared to last year. We're about $5,000 behind to, get, uh, to Givings to Mission and Service. So if you're in a position, I know not everybody is, but if you are in a position to um, keep up your Givings to Mission and Service Fund or even to increase them to Mission and Service, that will continue to be a, a wonderful blessing to, um, to the whole community, to Canada, and to the world. Our mission and Service Fund work is uh, essential. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your generosity and your gifts to Christ Church here and worldwide. Let's join now in the responsive reading that accompanies the lighting of our Christ candle. Christ, be our light. Shine in our hearts. Shine in your church today. Please stand as we join in our call to worship. Brothers and sisters in Christ, Rejoice, for we are loved by Almighty God, the ruler of heaven and earth, who knows each of us by name. God hears us and answers our cries for help. God shows us compassion and kindness. May our lives praise and magnify our great and awesome God. Let us worship God. Please be seated and we will listen to our hymn, Come and Find the Quiet Center.
Let us pray. Our loving God, we are so grateful to be together to worship and adore you here in this sanctuary or in our homes. We are here having heard your call to our hearts, our minds, and our souls as your children, your people, your church. We are here with our hearts bowed in reverence and wonder and joy, and take to our hearts the words of the psalmist who wrote, One thing I have desired, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all of the days of my life. Our hearts are your dwelling place, your place of presence with us, and we remember in trust, and we trust with devotion. We are here today of your calling in your love, and we ask your blessing upon us that we may shine in Christ to your glory. Amen. Let us now join in our prayer of confession, as you will find it on the screen. O oh God, you have shown us your ways and promised to walk with us. Through your Son, Jesus, you have given us an example to follow so that we might imitate your divine love. But we have not always kept the laws and rules you have given us. Forgive us when we forget whose image we bear. Give us the heart of Moses, who simply wanted to know your ways more clearly and to perceive your presence more nearly. Open us to your gentle correction so that we may faithfully bring your good news to a world in need. Amen. In the musical Godspell, the song day by day includes the words that have been ascribed to a 13th century bishop. And these were his words of prayer to God. May I know thee more clearly, love thee more dearly, follow thee more nearly day by day. And God's love and forgiveness enables us to be set upon the right path again as we stray, which we often will do but which is really our soul's true longing to return, to see God more clearly, love God more dearly, and follow God more nearly, day by day. And 1 Corinthians begins with the words, love is patient and love is kind. And God is patient and kind towards us and fills our hearts again, guides us to his path again, and forgives us to continue on in the image of his Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are forgiven. God is gentle and kind and leads us in his spirit to share this good news with the world so in need of this truth. Yes, there are times when we stray, but God does not stray. God loves us with unchanging, merciful, forgiving, magnificent love. Thanks be to God. And now let us listen to our songs of praise and adoration.
Jesus, our loving God, we are here to worship. We worship you in spirit and in truth. We don't worship empty philosophies that come from the world's way of thinking, but we focus on your message and truth in Jesus, which in all of its richness fills our lives. You renew our minds to bow before you, to celebrate, to sing out, and to shine the light that in your grace radiates from us. Here we are to worship you, Lord, as instruments in tune with you. Thank you for blessing us. We are here to worship you in devotion to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I Can Talk to God, written and illustrated by Helen Caswell. I can talk to God. In the morning when I get up, I thank God for the new day, even if it's raining. I thank God for my orange juice and cereal and my toast with jam on it. Some days I feel so happy I just have to jump up and down and thank God for the whole world and especially me and everything. I ask God to take care of all of us. I ask God for lots of things. Sometimes the answer is yes, and sometimes the answer is no. And sometimes God doesn't seem to answer me at all. But maybe that's because I don't listen well enough. You have to listen very carefully because God doesn't talk to you like your parents or your sister or anybody. God answers you inside your head. When I say, make my little sister good, I hear a little voice inside my head that makes me think, my little sister copies me, so I have to be good first. When I asked God for a pony, the little voice said, where would you put it? If I feel sad or if I feel angry, I talk to God about it and then I feel better. Sometimes it helps to get down on my knees and hold my hands together and close my eyes. Sometimes it's nice to pray with other people. Lots of people all talking to God at once. But best of all is when I'm in bed at night in the dark and nobody's there but God and me, and I can talk to God. Let us listen for our prayer for illumination today, um, a wonderful Israeli folk tune. Open your ears, O faithful people.
Our reading this morning is found in Exodus chapter 33. We will read verses 1 to 3 and 12 through 23. The Lord said to Moses, Get going, you and the people you brought up from the land of Egypt. Go up to the land I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I told them, I will give this land to your descendants, and I will send an angel before you to drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Go up to the land that flows with milk and honey, but I will not travel among you, for you are a stubborn and a rebellious people. If I did, I would surely destroy you along the way. One day Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, take these people up to the promised land, but you haven't told me whom you will send with me. You have told me I know you by name, and I look favorably on you. If it is true that you look favorably on me, let me know your ways, so I may may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. And remember that this nation is your very own people. The Lord replied, I will personally go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. Then Moses said, If you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. How will anyone know that you look favorably on me? on me and on your people, if you don't go with us. For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all other people on the earth. The Lord replied to Moses, I will indeed do what you have asked, for I look favorably on you and I know you by name. Moses responded, Then show me your glorious presence. The Lord replied, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will call out my name, Yahweh, before you, for I will show mercy to anyone I choose, and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. But you may not look directly at my face, for no one may see me and live. The Lord continued, Look, stand near me on this rock. As my glorious presence passes by, I will hide you in the crevice of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and let you see me from behind but my face will not be seen. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, we want to behold your glory We want to hear your truth, and we want to see your way. In this time of reflection, help us to listen to you, to receive from you, and to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Moses was in the tent of meeting with God. It was his prayer space with God, his sanctuary, his personal place of retreat, where he would take all his questions, his worries, his requests for guidance, and consult with God. It was set up outside the Israelites' encampment at the foot of Mount Sinai. Whenever Moses went into the tent of meeting, the Israelites came out of their tents and bowed down at the entrance of their tents in anticipation. What would God tell Moses? 
what was coming next. Moses was confident that he could go to God with his problems and that God would listen and respond. At that time in history, this was an exceptional relationship. People understood that God related to them as a nation, but it was very unusual for God to have a personal relationship with an individual. Each time Moses entered the tent of meeting, a pillar of cloud descended and hovered at the entrance while God spoke with Moses. And the people knew that Moses was walking on holy ground. Where is your place of retreat to be with God in prayer? Is it this special sanctuary where we commune with God and with each other in worship each week? Is it a special place in your home where you and God can be alone together? Is it a place on a walking trail when, when you're all alone among nature somewhere? Is it the warm comfort of your bed where you and God can connect one to one during the still of the night? On this day in the story, the Israelites were very afraid, and so was Moses. No wonder. Because here's the backstory that precedes today's scripture God was extremely angry with the people. Inside the tent, God told Moses that it was time for Moses to lead the people on the final leg of their journey and into the land that God had promised them through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their ancestors. But God was not going with them. No, God had had it with the Israelites. After all that God had done for the people, in the end, they had rejected God. God had rescued them from 400 years of slavery in Egypt. The people had forgotten. God had led them safely through the Sea of Reeds and delivered them from death by the Egyptian army who had been hot on their trail, but the people had forgotten. For 40 years, God had led them through the wilderness, protecting them with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, but the people had forgotten. God had provided the hungry, thirsting Israelites with manna and quails to feed them and water from a rock to slake their thirst. Imagine that miracle, but the people had forgotten. And now, to add insult to injury, the people had made an idol and were bowing down and worshiping that idol instead of worshiping God. It had happened when Moses was up on Mount Sinai with God. He was in prayer with God, waiting and listening intently as God gave him commandments to govern the lives of the Israelites. And Moses was gone for many days. Down in the valley, the Israelites gave up on Moses and on God. The people grew so impatient at Moses' long absence that they thought something had happened to him. And they demanded of Moses' brother Aaron, who was in charge in Moses' place, that Aaron make them idols to worship, the same kind of idols that they'd witnessed and experienced during their 400 years of slavery in Egypt. That's what they were familiar with. And Aaron agreed. He commanded the Israelites to bring them, bring him all their ornaments and their jewelry. And then he melted it all down and he made them a golden calf and they bowed down and worshipped it. They sacrificed to that golden calf and they were dancing all around it in a jubilant state of revelry. When God saw this, God told Moses and urged him to hurry down the mountain to stop it. God decided to kill the Israelites for their evil deed, but Moses pleaded with God not to destroy them. God listened to Moses and withdrew the threat to kill the Israelites. Moses rushed down with two stone tablets on which were written ten commandments that God had given him. And when he reached the people and he witnessed their sacrilege, he was livid. 
He smashed those stone tablets, signifying that the Israelites had broken their covenant relationship with God. God had been faithful to them, but they had responded by being unfaithful to God. They had broken the first and most important of the commandments to worship Yahweh, the Lord, and no other gods. God had said, I am the Lord your God, and you shall have no other God except me. No coin God, no car God, no condo God, no cottage God, no court God, no cuisine God, no clothing God. I am the Lord your God, and you shall have no other God before me. So here they were, God and Moses, in the tent of meeting together, with Moses hearing the disastrous news that God was not going any further with the Israelites. God would send an angel before them, but God was not going with them. God had declared the people to be stubborn, arrogant, proud, rebellious, and God wanted nothing more to do with them. And Moses was very afraid. He was fearful of God's rejection of the Israelites. How could they live without God in their lives? The thought of going it alone without God must have been terrifying. Moses, the people's mediator, pleaded with God not to abandon the Israelites. He said, merciful God, remember that this nation is your very own people. You've already endured so much trouble from them. Reconsider, reestablish your covenant with them. Reconcile with them. Moses referred to the Israelites three times as your people putting them firmly back into God's hands and God's heart. Merciful God, if you don't personally go with us to the promised land, we're not going to leave this wilderness. Life wouldn't be worth living. It's better to stay with you here in this harsh, barren desert than to live without you in the land of plenty. Come with us. Don't ever leave us. There are many Many people walking the face of the earth today who feel that God has rejected them and abandoned them. Maybe you've experienced a time in your life when you felt rejected and abandoned by God. If that happened to you, how did you handle that wilderness time in your life? The prospect of striking out on your own without God is a scary thing. But was there a Moses figure in your life, a mediator, someone with whom you could talk and share your pain, someone who prayed with you and for you on your behalf to God? The feeling and experience of being rejected and abandoned is awful. There are so many children on this planet who have been rejected and abandoned by troubled parents who died, and some who died in civil wars. These children are all alone. Some of them have been abused. Some of them have been bullied at home or school, and some of them grow up to be bullies. Some have been introduced to alcohol and drugs in their childhood. What chance do they have with that kind of upbringing? Some of them grow dependent upon it. Some fail to finish school. Some fail to hold down a job in adulthood. Some resort to theft and other forms of petty crime. And some spend their lives on the streets. They feel alone and perhaps rejected and abandoned by God. Jesse Thistle an indigenous person born and raised in Canada was one of them. He tells his life story in the best-selling autobiography, From the Ashes, which I highly recommend to you. When Jesse's parents' marriage ended, his father took him and his two older brothers, all little kids, and he introduced them to alcohol in their childhood, and he taught them how to steal to get by. 
His father left little Jesse and his elementary school brothers alone with no food or supervision in a dirty, run-down apartment for days on end, and the children were starving. If your parent rejects you and abandons you, why would you also not think that God has rejected and abandoned you? Even our Lord Jesus, in torturous agony on the cross, in his moment of deepest, darkest despair, felt rejected by God. He cried out, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And we remember how at the time of Jesus' arrest, all his disciples, his closest friends, all of them fled and left him alone with his persecutors. Oh yes, our Lord Jesus understands how it feels to be rejected and abandoned. But God didn't reject or abandon Jesus, not for a moment. And as we think of this story from Exodus today, we know that God never abandoned the ancient Israelites either. Because of Moses' faithfulness to God, God changed God's mind. What we see in this scripture passage is the incredibly intimate nature of the relationship between God and Moses. They trust each other completely. Moses dares to argue with God, dares to push God, trusting that it's safe to do so. God trusts Moses enough to grant Moses' requests. Despite being deeply hurt and offended by the betrayal of the Israelites, for whom God had done so much, the Israelites who broke the covenant by worshiping and bowing down to that golden calf idol, God does not abandon the people. When God's sense of justice and God's compassion collided, compassion won out. God showed amazing mercy and forgiveness and said to Moses, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Once assured of God's continued presence on the upcoming journey, Moses makes one more bold request of God. He pleads for a more intimate, personal experience of God. Please let me see your glorious presence. God tells Moses that it's not safe to look directly at God. God's glory is brighter than the sun, so bright that in comparison, the sun is like a dim little candle. God's glorious presence is so powerful that no one can see God and live. But God tries to come as close to meeting Moses' request as possible. With great care, God places Moses in the cleft in a rock. God passes by, glorious in love and light, and calls out God's name, the Lord. God shields Moses with God's hand and allows Moses to glimpse a vision of God's back. Moses is blessed with an amazing affirmation of his leadership and the knowledge that God will always, always be with him. The image of God in this story today is of a mysterious and a powerful presence full of tenderness and compassion. This merciful response of God is at the very heart of our biblical faith. No matter how many times we reject God, God does not reject or abandon us. When we err and come back to God with humble hearts, God wants us to know and be assured that we are forgiven for all our past mistakes. And God wants us to live in the knowledge that we're forgiven people. Like Moses, we have the assurance that God is really with us, lifting us up and traveling beside us on our journey. We are God's own people, and Jesus Christ is our mediator with God. 
God calls us by our name, and God reveals God's own name to us. We too are given glimpses of God passing by in our world, but we only see God's back, never God's face. God wants us to come into an ever-deepening intimacy with God more by believing than by seeing. Deeper intimacy with God, deeper trust. How do we experience that? Certainly, by being intentional in our prayer time with God, as Moses was and as Jesus was. One of the most important lessons that Jesus taught was that all of us have the potential for the same kind of friendship with God that Moses had. All of us can be known by God, and all of us can know God. Molly Blythe Teichart wrote about an intimate experience she had with God. It happened one night when she was on a pilgrimage in the Holy Land with a tour bus group of 50 people. And she said, one night after my camera broke and I lost the key to my room and I couldn't find my roommate, I walked down to the water's edge. The stars were out and the moon was shining bright. And standing there on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, I tried to imagine Peter and James and John with Jesus, and they were fishing, and they were eating, and they were talking to Jesus. And I was afraid. Not because it was dark and no one was around, but because for that moment, I felt very close to the presence of God. And I knew that I was a very small person, sinful and flawed. I stayed in that moment. And as I stood there, my fear turned to wonder at the grace and the privilege of the moment. As ordinary and as imperfect as I was, God had blessed me with this night by the Sea of Galilee amidst the ancient ghosts of the disciples fishing and eating and being with Jesus. Friends, in life, Sometimes we get only a glimpse of God, as Moses did from that cleft in the rock. But it is enough to assure us that we are on the right path, living our life according to God's will. As you seek deeper intimacy with God, like Moses and like our Savior Jesus did, may you find favor in God's sight. May you know God's graciousness and God's tender, loving mercy. And may God's ways always be made known to you. Amen. I invite you to stand in body or in spirit as we listen to our next hymn, Voices United 654. All my hope is firmly grounded. Let's stand together.
Please be seated. Now come to a, a special time in our service. at which time we will dedicate our new altar cloths. You may have noticed that we have the color orange here on our communion table um, cloth and on our antipendium in front of the pulpit and on the two uh, lectern strips by the Bible. And uh, these uh, gifts have been um, purchased by donations in loving memory of longtime church member um, Evelyn Jean Graham. Family members of Jean are here today, and I would like to invite them forward. Al Graham, Kevin Graham, Lori Reed, and also I would like to invite forward our worship committee chairpersons, Barry Wooten and Pat Fletcher, and they're going to join Reverend Louise and I in the dedication of the new altar clause. As they're coming forward, I'll just share with you that um, as we know in the secular season, we have four seasons of spring, summer, fall, and winter. In the church, we have seasons as well, and different colors represent those church seasons and pick up the mood or the theme of the season in which we find ourselves in the church year. The orange color is for the season of creation, which is the seventh and newest season of the church year that's been added by the Worldwide Christian Church about a dozen years ago or more. Um, these beautiful altar cloths are double-sided. So we have the orange season of creation, which begins um, in September, right after Labor Day, and goes right until Thanksgiving Sunday. And we've put them on one extra Sunday as we dedicate today. On the other side, we have the beautiful royal blue, and the royal blue um, designates the Advent season, which is the first season in the church year. The, uh, the royal blue color is selected as we are preparing for the coming of our royalty, our, our Lord Jesus Christ, the King of the world. And so today we are, are very grateful and happy to be joining together in this dedication of the new altar clause. I invite um, Al and Kevin and Lori to begin our dedication service today. We present these altar cloths to be dedicated to the glory and praise of God. And Barry and Pat, I invite you to come to the, one of you to come to the microphone and the other maybe to, but you will, you'll read our next part. Thank you. I'm trying to social distance. <laughs> I can't read it. I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> Pat's going to read it. I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> it's with deep gratitude we receive these altar cloths on behalf of ourselves, our worship committee, and our King's United Church family. We will care for them and use them re reverently. In the name of our holy and triune God, Creator, Christ, and Spirit, we dedicate these altar cloths to the glory of God. We dedicate these altar cloths to the glory of God. For the beauty of this holy place and for the inspiration of all God's people, we dedicate these altar cloths to the glory of God. In loving remembrance and in thanks and thanksgiving for the life of Evelyn Jean Graham, we dedicate these altar cloths to the glory of God. Let us pray. Creator God, source of all inspiration and beauty, we thank you for the gift of these lovely altar cloths now dedicated to the glory of your name. May your Holy Spirit guide us in reverent and loving use of all things, remembering always your great gift to us, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. And although we can't shake hands with the Graham family at this time, we can certainly applaud. Thank you. <laughs>
Let us pray. Holy God, you stand above and beyond us in your holiness. We can't fully grasp your glory, but in your servant Moses and in your son Jesus, you have given us a glimpse of your ways. You are a God of justice, but you are also merciful, compassionate, and full of steadfast love for your whole creation. God, we want an ever-deepening intimacy with you, but you're always taking the first step toward us because you're longing for us and deepen deepening intimate relationship with us is so strong. Lord, we thank you for never rejecting us, never abandoning us. But even though you sometimes seem far away, you're always here with us, closer than the breath we breathe, and walking with us on our journey. In worship, in prayer, and in the witness of our brothers and sisters in Christ, in world events and in the study of Scripture, you keep speaking to us. Thank you for your willingness to continue the conversation. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our brother, and in his very own prayer words we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Jesus said, Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. With gratitude for all we have received, we offer our gifts to God. Let us listen to our response, our offering response, Voices United 240, verse 2. I invite you to stand for our, the dedication of our offering and to remain standing for our final hymn. Gracious God, these offerings that have been placed in the box in our narthex, those given by e-transfer, those dropped off in our mailbox, those given through pre-authorized remittance, all of our gifts represent just a bit of what we owe you. All that we have and all that we are belong to you. As we give these gifts and offer ourselves freely to you, may others know your goodness and your love through our offerings. Amen. And let us join in our closing hymn. <laughs>
Go now to serve our living God whose image we bear. Trust in God's goodness and closeness. May all our work be done in faith. Travel on joyously with the hope that comes through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And let us listen to our benediction response.